what to do, where to go, what's happening and when. The spotlight's on fun and excitement all this week from the Lehigh Valley and beyond. So check out your calendar and let's go. Welcome to Let's Go, I'm Grover Silcox. On this episode, we're gonna check out some of General George Washington's favorite places to go in Bucks County and also in Bethlehem. But first, we're going to get creative in South Bethlehem at Color Me Mine. Let's go. Color Me Mine is a paint chip pottery studio. We're located in South Bethlehem. We're one out of 160 in the United States and another 40 around the world. When you walk in to Color Me Mine, we know that a lot of people have never been here before. Our goal is to really make everyone feel at home here. They can pick out paint, we glaze and we fire it. It takes a week to be returned. If you have a vision or a, a, something in mind, we can help you achieve it. We have wonderful artists on staff who will help you as much or as little as you need. We also do canvas, acrylic. We welcome anyone at any age. We get newborns to do handprints and footprints. And you know, they can make mugs and cups for grandma and grandpa. We can celebrate any birthday party from two to 90. I feel like people come in and they get a little addicted to it. Once they see that first piece come out of the kiln, they get excited and they want to come back and bring their friends. Color Me Mine is art for everyone. We really strongly believe that everyone who walks in the door here can create um, a piece of art. And it's just a great space, a great energy. This is a little sneak peek behind the scenes. After you're done painting, we dip everything in a vat of glaze. They're set to dry. We stilt them and put them in our kilns at 1900 Fahrenheit. It takes a day to get get to 1900 and a day to come out. And when we take it out the kilns, they come nice and bright and shiny. These are completely food safe and ready for you to use. You can sit wherever you like. You can stay as long as you like. You can bring food in, um, refreshments, and then we'll kind of take you through to our design center, walk you through the process of um, using the supplies, use, doing the techniques. We assist you, we'll sit down at the table with you, we'll get the brush, we'll help you out with the techniques if you need it. This is our assistant manager, Zoe, and she is painting a Buddha. Um, and she is doing a dot technique. We have these little uh, liner bottles that you can use for fine details and writing. Paints that we use are metal-based, but they are non-toxic, washable. They don't stain your clothing. Kids can finger paint with them. We do pet paw prints with them, so completely safe. Color Me Mine is a really fun place to express yourself. It's great because people put their phones away and actually talk to each other. It, it kind of solidifies what we do. And we do this for the love of art, for the love of community, for the love of family. The National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum in Coatesville forges the story of Luke and Steel and an industry with roots in the 18th and 19th centuries. Visitors can explore Lucan's beautiful headquarters building, exhibits, and artifacts, and a former motor house that powered the mills. The National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum is a great, vibrant place to come explore. Over 300 years of iron and steel here, specifically in Chester County. The Lucan Steel Company was formed in 1810 until about the late 1990s when the company was then sold to Bethlehem. The original founder was Isaac Pennock. I am the seventh generation from the original founder. We stepped forward and said, you know, the family would like to buy the building back to return it to the communities. What you'll see when you come to the National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum, we have a corporate office building which we really try and tell the story of the corporation. This is the president's office, and in here you get a sense of what it was like to head a major corporation. And this is set up at about the 1950s, 1960s office. The exhibits and things that you get to uh, come and see when we're here. We have train models, great train collection. We try and divide it up into the process and the products and the people. You can view hard hats and boots from steel workers, and we touch on labor. 
This is the exhibit room at the National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum that contains our models of the process and the products. You have rolling mills and plant models as well as some of the ship models. This is a model of the 206 inch rolling mill. It is 206 inches wide but will roll plates 204 inches wide and this is the largest rolling mill in North America. It is almost 100 years old and this is where aircraft carriers and nuclear reactors and uh, submarines are built. You're able to go and, and, and really connect to history in a personal way. We brought home about 28 pieces from the World Trade Center. One of them is on active display. We are in the 120 inch motor house, which means that it is the house that the motor was stored in that drives the 120 inch mill. And some of that equipment is around here. We have generators and motors on site that powered the mill. What you see here, this is the Guppy One, and this is built here in Coatesville and was owned by the Sun Oil Company, or Sunoco. It was two half hemispheres and they welded together to create this round ball, which is a pressure containment vessel enabling the submarine to dive around 1,000 feet down. It weighs about 5,000 pounds, and it was used to inspect the foundations of their deep sea oil rigs. The National Iron and Steel Heritage Museum, we really encourage people to explore becoming architects and engineers, and that's really what the Iron and Steel Museum is about. On the outskirts of Lambertville in Huntington County, New Jersey, you'll find the Holcomb Jimison Farmstead Museum, an historic farm which celebrates farming and rural life in Huntington County back in the day. The Holcomb Jamison Farmstead Museum was incorporated in 1983 and it's completely run by volunteers. All the collection has all been donated. The farmstead was started primarily to encourage uh, rural history and agriculture in Hunterdon County and the state of New Jersey. It was started back in the early 60s by the last farmer who is here, Milo Jimison and his wife. The main buildings that were here, the original farmhouse, which is the oldest house in Hunterdon County that everybody believes, was built in 1711, then there's an 1811 edition, and then an 1859 edition. You can go into the summer kitchen, all the uh, period cooking utensils and the wood-burning stove and all those kind of things are there. And then when you go into the center section, the old walk-in stone fireplace has been restored. That room has all the cast iron uh, cooking utensils and stuff for that. And then the 1811 portion of the house has all the period furniture in there with rope beds and desks and chairs and stuff like that. And along with that, the, uh, the original barn structure, which is now our main museum. When you go through the exhibits, you'll see that we um, have a variety of things that go past rural agricultural history. We've had a number of people who have helped us along the way. One is Stuart B. Kane. He was a museum enthusiast. He came to the president and asked the president to take some items that were very large. The president refused him. He said, we have no place to store it. And as the story goes, Mr. Kane took out his checkbook and wrote a check for $60,000, and he said, now you have the storage. We started out as a, a farm museum and then have branched out over the years into a, a real uh, eclectic co collection. The barn itself has a doctor's office, a dentist office, a carpenter shop, basket making, a meat processing. All those things that were done by hand back in the late 1800s, early 1900s are all here. They're all original. We're now in the Morris Lever, MD, and dentist exhibit. You were given his dental chair and drill, which looks very much like today's drill, except it was run by foot power. We have a working blacksmith shop that's here every week that they, they're making stuff in there on the forge. Well, welcome to the Holcomb Jimison Farm blacksmith shop, all right? Uh, we have a lot of things we, we do here. We'll demonstrate things. We actually let people make stuff. If something comes into the farm and needs repair, we'll copy it and make repair for stuff. What Zach is going to be making is a hook, all right? He's going to be making, this is a, the piece he's going to be making. But these are the steps he has to make. He's going to put a point on it, curl it, 
bend it, then flatten it, and we're, we're gonna put a hole in it. So that's what he does. We have a general store that has everything in it except the storekeeper. We have a barber shop and a post office. There's actually a telegraph in there as well, along with the wooden post office boxes. I get excited showing people the history, showing them the artifacts. I'm a retired teacher, so I just never stop talking, and I guess that's why I gravitated here. I just love history, and if you love history, you can't get this stuff online. You can't see some of the things because they're one of a kind. Doodle went to town riding on a pony. Hey, you want to feel patriotic? Head over to the Moland House in Warwick Township, Bucks County. Here, George Washington and his troops hunkered down in August of 1777. While there, he met with some other really big wigs, no pun intended, who fought and served in the American Revolution. The Moland House is a very important structure in Bucks County and certainly for the entirety of American history. It was at this house that in August of 1777, George Washington and 11,000 troops camped here on their way to defend the capital city, which was Philadelphia, from the British attack. John Moland was a successful attorney in Philadelphia. He made enough money to be able to build this stone house out here as a summer retreat for his family. There are a number of important rooms in the house, one of which is John Mullen's office. It would have been the private quarters for the family, and Washington probably would have used this office in order to be able to meet privately with his generals and so forth. In the office here, we have the typical things that you would find. We have a book press, for example, where Mullen would have kept his law library, an English 18th century writing desk, a clock, a case clock and uh, a backgammon table, which is interesting. Now, the reason we know this is because we do have an inventory that was taken at the time of his death of his possessions. Now, then there was a larger parlor. We call it the Council of War Room, which would have been the family's public space. And this would have been where Washington met with groups of individuals. We have the room set up here as if it were uh, for the Council of War, including maps of the area, the Chesapeake Bay and so forth, and here also we have a copy of the minutes of the Council of War meeting that took place here. Also in the Council of War room would be the steps that you would take to go up. There are two bedrooms upstairs, one of which what we today would call the master bedroom, which would have been the Mullins bedroom, and then there is another bedroom. They had eight children. The girls probably slept in one room, the boys out, literally out in the hallway, which is divided. The hearth actually spans the entire width of the house, which is somewhat unusual. It's a state-of-the-art 18th century, 1750s kitchen. Basically, you put these things on the hearth with coals underneath them to keep them warm. The bake kettle would have had ashes on top and on the bottom, or you could hang something over the fire. The simplest of cooking tools, most of the pans and pots are cast iron. It would have been never-ending work with people getting up first thing in the morning and cooking all day. One of the reasons why this house is so important is because there are so many important people who were here. Um, for example, the, some of the generals that people will recognize uh, would have been Nathaniel Green, who literally was Washington's right-hand man. General Lafayette, who was, by the way, only 19 years old when he came over here. And he, for the first time, took up his duties as a major general in the uh, Continental Army here at the Mullen House at this encampment. This is Central Bucks County. It was the best built house in the neighborhood. It provided an ideal location. And also there is a stream with running water, a grist mill. And so as a result, this is where Washington chose to have his, his headquarters.
Art Yard serves as a contemporary art center in Frenchtown, New Jersey, along a very scenic part of the Delaware River. This hub of creativity was founded by a group of artists, filmmakers, curators, and writers. Take a look. Art Yard is an incubator for creative expression and a catalyst for uh, collaborations that reveal the transformational power of art. What that means in real life is we have an art exhibition space, a theater, we have a film program, poetry, live music, a lot of collaborative art projects. Richard Selesnik and Nicholas Kahn, they came here and they described their work as world creation. They are photographers, painters, sculptors, writers, and they apply all of these arts in their work. They come up with a concept and then they bounce it around and create something out of it. One of the great pleasures of this kind of work is to pass it back and forth and see the surprise that comes from the other person's imagination. What we always look for in, in the artists that we show here is an element of surprise and an element of beauty and that beauty could be ugliness, it could be the beauty of a difficult thing. So one of the virtues of this space is that it's, uh, it can be reconfigured in an infinite variety of ways. Uh, we built some movable walls here. Because of the loft of the ceiling, we often do hanging installations. There's a lot of wonderful floor space in the middle for sculpture. And we try to reinvent it each time and make sure that each exhibition is a complete departure from the last. So we're in the Art Yard Theater now. This is our temporary theater. We are building a state-of-the-art theater in another location that will have more technical capabilities. Here you see the backdrop that we use for live music, poetry, and other live events. And behind it is a projection screen. And we have a film series that's called Film Yard that is curated by a, an excellent independent film producer from Los Angeles who brings filmmakers here to talk about their craft. We have a vibrant series of art exhibitions scheduled on an ongoing basis, and also many live poetry, music, and film events. The next art exhibition opens on April 28th, and it's a meditation on place and memory. It's called the Memory Palace. So we're here in the uh, Art Yard warehouse and we're uh, building giant clouds for the next exhibition. Uh, we're building 15 of these clouds. Um, they'll be illuminated and they will float over the recreation of the town of Frenchtown with uh, text and poetry to accompany it. We look for art that has meaning, that has a kind of beauty, however you define that, and an element of surprise. You know, many a founding father enjoyed a cool libation at Bethlehem Sun Inn. Now you can enjoy one too, right here at the Tavern at the Sun Inn. I stopped by to check it out and also speak with author Mark Will Weber about presidential drinking. I also spoke with one of the owners about the tavern. The Tavern at the Sun Inn is uh exactly what it should be and that is a house of entertainment in the city of Bethlehem that reflects on the history of what was here but also progresses into the modern age. You know we've got a museum in the building, we also have a, a modern restaurant and bar. We're trying to make it the place where you're welcome just like a city tavern used to be back in the day. The Sun Inn, in general, was a, uh, a tavern that was uh, built by the Moravians back in the late 1750s as a house of entertainment sanctioned by King George. It became well known throughout the colonial period as one of the best taverns uh, out there. That's why you had many of our founding fathers, John Adams, John Hancock, Nathaniel Green, Marquis de Lafayette, five presidents, that includes George Washington, and other dignitaries stay here. You walk into the museum floor, which is restored 
back to what it looked like in the 1760s. So if you come in, you'll find the guest stuba, which is the guest space where guests were entertained. You'll find a working suite, which was one of the reasons why many uh, influential people stayed here. You'll find a colonial kitchen on the museum floor. Downstairs, we have our Rathskeller, which is our colonial drinking cellar. Then upstairs, we have two dining rooms, as well as our tavern bar. We worked really hard on this room in that uh, it was pretty blank when we got in here, and we wanted it to be as uh, reflective of the period as we could be with a uh, modern twist of an actual bar. So we did the beadboard on the front. The flags and whatnot are all of the colonial era. All the pictures in the room are of individuals that have stayed at the inn. The building in and of itself is a museum, a restaurant, a tavern, and is the future home to our micro distillery tasting room, uh, Christmas City Spirits. Joining me at the bar is author Mark Will Weber, author of the book Mid Juleps with Teddy Roosevelt about presidential drinking. And Mark, you're going to be appearing here at the Tavern at the Sun Inn uh, to talk about your books. and. Uh, and how the presidents drank. Let's start with uh, the first president, President Washington. What did George Washington prefer? Well, Washington is one of the few presidents that I claim alcohol actually improved. And I say that because the knock against Washington is that he was sort of a cold, uh, standoffish kind of guy. But when he had a couple glasses of champagne or Madeira or uh, a, a dark beer called Porter that he liked, he would loosen up and he'd become quite gregarious. And Porter was one of his favorites, right? Which we have yes. a sample here. And the Yards Brewery in Philly uh, actually makes a, a pretty good rendition of what Washington was drinking back in the day. And Moving to the 20th century, another very popular president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he, he liked his alcohol as well. Well, Roosevelt really loved cocktails. He used to like to make his own. He was by most uh, stories, he was pretty bad at it. He would just dump this and that. But he also liked something called the rum swizzle, which we have here. And the rum swizzle, uh, even though it, again, dates back in the colonial days, uh, he liked to drink those when he'd go yachting, you know, so. <laughs> but when he played poker, he liked to drink beer, so. Well, there's tons more to know about presidential drinking and the drinking of the generals during the Civil War. And you can learn it all here at the Tavern at the Sun Inn on Wednesday, April 18th with author Mark Will Weber. Have you recently gone on a family trip in or around the greater Lehigh Valley? Have you found a hidden gem for a date night or a new location to spend the afternoon? Do you have photos or videos? Well, Let's Go wants to hear from you. Share your videos and or photos, and we may feature them in a future episode. Visit WLVT.org for more information. You like riddles? Here's one. What has more than 100 departments, free parking for up to 2,500 vehicles, food, fashions, and tons of things you can use, and it's open year-round? If you said the Quaker Town Farmer's Market in, well, you guessed it, Quaker Town, Bucks County, you're spot on. The Quaker Town Farmer's Market is a, a large indoor-outdoor farmer's market and flea market. People come on a weekly basis to shop for their groceries, as well as make it a, an event and a destination for their families. The market's been here since the 30s. In fact, we just celebrated our 85th anniversary last summer. Years and years ago, there weren't all these big shopping centers, so the only place you could really go to shop was the Q Mart, Quaker Town Farmer's Market. And these families built their businesses on that and have survived all these years with it. We have all the awesome fresh produce from the farm, their butcher cut meats. We have all that awesome stuff. But we have a video store. An arcade, slot car races, jewelry, clothing, shoes. We have outdoor entertainment during the summer when it's nice out. We'll have bands out on the stage. We have the flea market. We have a pet store. We have an event where we bring in heavy equipment and, and trucks and things for the kids to play on. We also have restaurants that you can find food from all over the different parts of the world. 
We have a wide variety of restaurants here, which is one of the fun things about the market. We have your traditional American fare, which would be, you know, your pizza, your chicken wings. We have sushi. We have Puerto Rican food, authentic Mexican. And we also have more of like the diner fare. We have Grandma's, which is like a 50s cafe theme. We have the Super Bowl, which has been here for quite a few generations. We have ice cream, candy. We have literally something for everyone. We are visiting Record Revival. Record Revival has been a staple at the Quakertown Farmer's Market for over 30 years. Ralph has owned this store and he carries a wide variety of vinyl records. He has CDs, both old and new releases. He still has cassette tapes. We have walked over to Frederick's Meats. Frederick's Meats has been a staple at the market for over 34 years. They are one of our multi-generational families that have been here. We're on the sun now, and Tom is the current owner who is running Frederick's Meats. We are at Finn's Feathers Paws and Claws, the pet store at the Quakertown Farmer's Market. They have fish, birds, ferrets, bunnies, all kinds of different animals here, pet supplies, but it's an awesome place to bring the kids because not only can you buy what you need, but you can make a new little friend. <laughs> you are a stinker. How pretty is Cleo? So pretty. a really good picture of tradition and also changing with the times. You can bring the whole family um, or you can just get your groceries that you need for the week. We're that family friendly place that you can keep coming back to and bring the kids and have fun. Well, folks, that's all for now. Thanks for joining us. Come back next week where we'll have more fun things for you to do on Let's Go. Death in Paradise. A suspect in a Caribbean murder case is dead in London. And when Humphrey looks up Martha, he can't hide his broken heart. This is what you chose. I really very much hope you'd have chosen me. Death in Paradise. Thursday at 9 on PBS 39. Above grade level tutor students one on one in math, English, and other subjects, including Spanish, in the comfort of their own home. The goal is to promote excellent study habits, classroom self confidence, and a minimum average raise of one grade level. Above grade level lehighvalley.com.